Paris Agreement, COP27, the Montreal Protocol, why putting them side by side, what were they about and why even mentioning them at all? Well, here is why. The Montreal Protocol is considered the most successful global environmental agreement of all times. The Paris Agreement, as I'm sure you know, is the best known and most important global environmental agreement of all times. And COP27, which we just had in November 2022, is the most recent global environmental summit. And so in this video, I want to contrast the Montreal Protocol and Paris Agreement, not looking at the fine print and at the footnotes, no, 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 but I want to contrast them, put them side by side, look at the differences, look at the similarities, see what they had in common, what they tried to achieve and what they achieved and didn't achieve as well. And then after that comparison, I want to look at COP27, the most recent environmental summit, through the lens on the back of that comparison, right? Because there's no point of looking at COP27 in isolation. Hi. I'm Jan from sustainablebutterflies.com.au and on the screen you see my five pillars of sustainability. The Montreal Protocol is a legally binding treaty which was signed in 1987, 35 years ago, by all UN member states, United Nations member states. It is the only treaty ever signed by all UN member states, environmental agreement, right? Back then, they found, the scientists found, that there are certain substances, chemicals, known as ODSs, ozone layer depleting substances, when, and when they are released, such as from refrigerants and aerosols and air cones, uh, uh, hydrochlorofluorocarbons and chlorofluorocarbons, various industrial operations, about 100 of these substances, when released, up to the stratosphere, they are depleting, thinning out this ozone layer, which is like this protective blanket in the stratosphere, which protects us, everyone, from harmful UV rays, right? It's kind of like a, like a layer of sunscreen at the top of the stratosphere. Imagine, if you go out and put a thick layer of sunscreen, imagine that every minute, right, you would be rubbing off that sunscreen. So with the cloth, right? So after two hours, there will be no sunscreen left and you would get skin cancer, you would get burnt, at least very badly burnt, and, and uh, you would perhaps get skin cancer. Now they found that this depletion of ozone layer by releasing these chemicals, it is causing a skin cancer much more, like 10 times more, and eye cataracts as well. So they try, it was like a race, to get rid of these substances as fast and po as possible. It was really, really big deal, right? And it worked to date. 98%, and by the way, link is in the description with all the proof and stats and all that, so you can find it there. To date, 98% of these substances have been phased out and the ozone layer is expected to fully recover by 2050, right? Now, why did it work? Well, Everybody signed. It was mandatory, so all countries got their targets and they, they must have met these targets. And also, there was a multilateral fund set up where the developed countries, wealthy countries, were financially supporting developing countries, because obviously stratosphere is shared by all, so that these developing countries can also replace these harmful ODSs, ozone layer depleting substances, from their fridges, from their air cones and from their aerosols, from all their manufacturing processes, etc. The Paris Agreement in 2015, also a legally binding environmental treaty signed by most of the countries, 196 of them, I'm sure you know what it's about. It's about, its goal is to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees against pre-industrial levels, right? By reducing greenhouse gas emissions, okay? So that is like this one huge global target, but each country has they set their own targets, right? Which collectively are aiming to this one huge global target of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, okay? However, the difference there 
while on paper it is legally binding Paris Agreement, these targets are not mandatory. There are no penalties for offenders such as fines or embargoes and there is no uh, enforcement mechanism, right? If they don't meet their targets, uh, nothing's gonna chase them, like uh, they're not gonna get punished uh, as in say um, the international court, right? So the Paris Agreement has no teeth. As William Nordhaus, the Nobel Prize winner for economics on climate change said, Paris Agreement is all carrots but no sticks. So has the Paris Agreement been successful? Well, yes and no. In terms of ambition and a commitment and energy you know, and consensus reaching of everyone, yes, from that angle, yes. But from the results point of view, no because emissions have been rising and it is very unlikely, it may be 1% likelihood, that we will actually meet that target of limiting, the, the limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. Very unlikely. Which brings us now to, that, uh, to the next point and that is to compare Montreal Protocol and Paris Agreement. So what, what did they have in common? How were they similar? Well, both of them recognize that there are certain substances for Montreal Protocol were these ODSs and for Paris Agreement the greenhouse gas uh, emissions, planet warming emissions such as carbon dioxide, methane and others, these substances and we must do our best, each country, right, to get rid of these substances. So they sat around and they signed, signed a document. Another similarity was that they were quite clear on the problem, so what is the problem and what, what is the source of the problem and how to get rid of the problem, right? So for with the Montreal Protocol, the problem was these ODSs and depletion of the protective ozone layer. So that was the problem. With Paris Agreement is the release of greenhouse gases, which are not depleting anything, but they are thickening, they are creating this ever thicker blanket which traps heat inside, right? So that's the problem. They knew what that was. They knew the sources of these nasties with, with the Montreal Protocol. It was in refrigerants and in, in uh, aerosols and in aircons and that sort of stuff. About 100 classified and categorized ODSs with Paris Agreement. They also know what they are. It's uh, methane and carbon dioxide. And they also know their sources, right? From burning petrol, burning coal, chopping down wood, farting and belching cows and many other things. So they knew that and they also knew what to do to get rid of it, right? With the, uh, the Montreal Protocol, they had to replace, find alternatives like from the aerosols. There's some propellant in there that forces the spray out. So they had to find some alternative or different refrigerant in the fridge to keep the, the fridge cool right? or the aircon refrigerant, right? So they had to find different synthetic alternatives. And now with Paris Agreement, we're finding alternatives to uh, fossil fuels, for example, right? Instead of burning coal, we're generating electricity by soil and wind, right? Or the driving petrol cars, greenhouse gas releasing, we are driving electrical vehicles. So that, these were the similarities. Okay, now there were three key differences between the Montreal Protocol and Paris Agreement. Uh, the obvious difference is they dealt with different things, right? So the Montreal Protocol was about uh, uh, saving and protecting this ozone layer, protective layer, so that we don't get burnt, uh, uh, you know, we don't get skin cancer and eye cataracts, right? The Paris Agreement is about not creating the thick layer of greenhouse gases because they trap heat inside and the, which, uh, which aggravates uh, and worsens global warming. So that's obvious, right? But here are the three key differences between two. Number one, the Montreal Protocol had actually mandatory targets. So the countries, they couldn't get off the hook. They actually had to get rid of these ODSs. Now, on the other hand, Paris Agreement has voluntary targets. There is no enforcement mechanism, right? So that's one difference. The second difference is in the nature and logistics of these actual substances, these protocols or treaties are dealing with. The Montreal Protocol is dealing with uh, about a hundred 
ODSs, ozone layer depleting substances, but it is quite constrained, narrow subset of society and environment, right? Um, they are in refrigerants, in aerosols, in aircons, and in car engines and somewhere. Where, so the, the replacement and substitution is essentially a chemical engineering and logistical exercise, right? Where you replace perhaps one out of 50 chemicals or two out of 50 and you find a different one and you put it into this and you're the same with fridges. Like, I'm not trivializing it. I'm, I'm, I know it requires highly skilled uh, knowledge and all that, but it's quite uh, narrow, thin uh, uh, sliver of society, of daily life, right? Whereas greenhouse gas, gases, right? That is in everything, right? We're talking in, it, it requires a complete uh, transformation, overhaul of society, whether it's transport, agriculture, electricity generation, uh, what we eat, right, logistics, uh, everything. Uh, getting electricity, whether we burn coal or uh, drive petrol cars, what we eat, the car engines, right, and, and aeroplanes, how they fly, what is their engine, and that sort of thing. It's not just one narrow subset, it's in everything uh, what we do across all fields or most fields because everything leaves carbon footprint. So that's the, that's the second biggest difference. And the third big difference actually brings us to COP27. Remember that in the beginning I told you that this successful uh, Montreal Protocol, right, uh, the most successful environmental agreement of all times, one of its features was this multilateral fund where the developed countries helped financially developing countries to get rid of their ODSs, ozone layer depleting substances from their fridges and from their manufacturing uh, processes and aerosols, etc. Right? Right. So up until two weeks ago, because COP27, Conference of Parties in Egypt, only took place in November, two weeks ago, right? Now we're in the early December. Until then, it was one of the differences between the Paris Agreement and the Montreal Protocol. Because the Montreal Protocol had multilateral fund and Paris Agreement didn't have any fund of that nature. But now it's actually a similarity, right? Because now the Paris Agreement, as agreed at uh, COP27, we now have this fund. It's called Loss and Damage Fund. And it's like kind of like, we don't know the fine print yet. It doesn't have teeth yet. It is, there is no, it's not mandatory, it's all voluntary, it's not clear who's gonna contribute, how much, and who exactly is gonna get it, but it does, it's okay, it's a first step, they agreed on, you know, let's put this bucket together, and then it'll be decided later on who's gonna contribute exactly, how much, and who's gonna get it. The wealthy countries, developed countries, they were dragging their feet, they were stonewalling it, they didn't want this fund, because they were afraid that it will open a door to something like admission of guilt and reparations. And once the door is open, then they will be, you know, responsible for paying billions and billions of dollars forever, well, I don't know for how long, to many, like 50 or 100 developing countries for something like admission of guilt, well, okay, we admit that we have been releasing so many, so much, uh, you know, greenhouse gases and that sort of stuff, and we will pay reparations. So that's, they made sure that it's not reparations. It's loss and damage. It's only for vulnerable countries, most vulnerable countries, such as, I don't know exactly which ones, but the most vulnerable ones are countries such as Kiribati, Maldives, Bangladesh, those countries that are literally disappearing from the face of the earth, right? And uh, it's kind of, it's more focused on uh, insurance schemes and, uh, and help uh, from, uh, from, uh, to recover from disasters such as uh, massive flooding like we had in, they had in Pakistan a few months ago. That kind of thing, right? It's not reparations, okay? Anyway, so, that was the overview of these three key international agreements and one summit. Anyway, I know that this is a little bit generic, a little bit abstract, a little bit uh, un universal, but as I said in the beginning, I think it's important to zoom in from bit and between the particular 
to universal and vice versa and explore this territory because it's very dynamic. Anyway, thank you very much for watching and you have a great day. Bye.